This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audio, visual, news, and information. How are you doing? This is uh, Tim Albright. I'm your host. With us this week is Michael Braithwick. Michael is from Clear One, and this week he is also representing the fabulous uh, Avenue Alliance. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you very much for the invitation, and I do have my AVB uh, underoos on. God, well, geez, thank you for that. <laughs> Oh, underoos. Anyhow. Uh, also with us is Kelly Perkins. Uh, Kelly is formally, this is your first time on for, for, since, 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 uh, since doing your switch. So uh, uh, you were formerly uh, the, the, uh, the marketing guru goddess extraordinaire at Vadio, and now you are doing the same thing at AVI Systems. How are you, man? I am doing well. Hello, everyone. And yes, I'm two weeks in to AVI Systems. I have apparently join the dark side as a lot of people keep telling me I don't know I I quite like it um, thus far so I can't say I agree with everyone but um, yeah it's fairly new and, and it's exciting so that's what they told me when I joined an integrator from patient <laughs> so. I don't quite get it <laughs> do you get it my I mean my own Michael's a manufacturer so he's the you know he's not the dark side I guess all, all of us integrators are dark sides <laughs> I don't know uh, last week we, we introduced you to our, our new sponsor, and uh, so AV Nation is, is proud to uh, be brought to you by Middle Atlantic Products and their Tech Ped Technology Pedestals, Middle Atlantic Products. What great systems are built on! And thank you to Middle Atlantic. If you like what we do, go by and, and, and say hi to them. Uh, coming up in just over two months, um, Infocom is coming up, and you can check out their Tech Ped. We'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, as the show goes along this week, uh, we're going to talk about some um, up and coming and, and kind of grassroots AV products. Uh, I had one company email me and, and kind of caught onto them uh, by Twitter, and they're doing a Kickstarter program. We have a, a good friend of, of, of AV Nation, and um, it's Chris Netto, uh, who started uh, Red Band. He's doing something as well. So I want to kick around kind of some ideas that. You know that maybe we're born in the garage and and maybe you know popped up or maybe some ideas that nobody's thought of. Uh, Cat six and why you need a professional to do the termination. I have a story about that. Uh, speaking of the dark <laughs> side <coughs> and unions, <clears throat> uh, sorry that just gets caught in my throat sometimes. <laughs> and competition from security vendors. But first, uh, this week was the National Association of Broadcasters annual event, uh, NAB show. Also in Las Vegas, uh, Infocom this year is in Vegas. Uh, the reason I bring this up is a couple different reasons. First of all, there are some things that the broadcasters do that incredibly impact us, right? I mean, everything from making sure that the Super Bowl, if you're doing residential, is is on your, your client's big screen to making sure that whatever you're bringing into a conference room um, from content uh, from Blu-rays all the way down to, you know, streaming the little, you know, 480 or 280i images. One thing uh, that was interesting was the fact that Sennheiser announced that they have joined uh, the Dante. Um, I don't know if it's the Alliance or you know, the, you know, they're joining Dante. How about that? And, and, and I find this interesting. And, and Michael, we'll kick it, kick, it off, kick it off with you because they're also part of the Avenue Alliance, um, and they've got some some ABB products. So is this maybe you know just them trying to be different things? You know, making you're hedging their bets, I guess, is the best way to put it. Or is Dante different enough from the other um, the other standards um, and the other protocols that this makes sense for, for them? I think it makes a lot of sense for them. Uh, what you're really talking about is um, them being able to cover all the different bases, so to speak, uh, and, and the different protocols and different applications, really. Um, there are requirements on the uh, AVB side that um, are are not present in the Dante. So um, there are certain applications that uh, Dante has done really well with promoting, uh, and um, you know, as as a, a another manufacturer uh, that builds products like that, we we see it the same way. Um, you you really have to kind of support all of the various uh, applications and standards. Um, Dante has a, a very good uh, a group and alliance of folks um, that are working, of course, on the sending, shipping the audio on uh, uh, across the network. And so um, I think that um, 
there have definitely been some interesting conversations uh, in some of the AVB or the Avenue uh, meetings um, about them. Uh, early on, there were some rough s starts, I would say, uh, with that. Um, but uh, I think if you look at uh, how the Alliance is today and how all of the other technologies um, that exist out there, including Dante and uh, you know, HD base T, uh, uh, there's room for all of them. And I think you're going to see networking that brings them all together. Uh, when you talk about Internet Protocol, for example, there's the Internet Protocol is not one thing, and it's not one protocol. There are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of coexisting protocols. Um, if you want to talk about a video conferencing site, like WebRTC is a, is a good example of a, a new version of that. But Dante um, has its place in the marketplace. Uh, it's definitely, uh, um, there are plenty of integrators that do distribution products and, and things with that. So I think it makes sense from Sennheiser just because microphones need to be on their audio need, need to be there. So they're going to have to support it. It's if if you want to be in the pro AV business, you're going to have to be able to support that. Support them, but yeah. Ke Kelly, from from a, a standpoint of of when they announced this, not you know necessarily you know, yay, they're on Dante. I, I find it interesting though that they did it during NAB and, and not during something like um, necessarily Infocom. Infocom would be would have been nice, but also um, some of the more you know. The, the live touring and events show, either either you know Infocom Live or, or some of the other um, the other live staging and events shows, instead of the National Association of Broadcast Broadcasters. Is there? Do you think maybe there's a reason that they did it during the broadcasters um, expo and, and and trade show, or maybe it's just the fact that it was ready and and they were ready to roll it out? Yeah, I mean, as a manufacturer, you always want to announce your big news at the big shows, and that's probably one of the biggest shows you know this year other than Infocom and CES so I think just from that avenue that's probably why they did it I mean I don't I'm not I don't know a lot about Dante or audio standards you know to be honest so I don't know all the nits and nats about it but just from a marketing standpoint I would say yeah just because it's a big show it's a big show and you get a big spotlight there with a, with a ton of, of press so yeah. Uh, all right, uh, moving on for mo some more uh, NAB coverage. Uh, one of the more interesting uh, companies that, that I do business with, and, and I've, I've put some installations, and that's BrightSign. Uh, BrightSign is a fairly robust, fairly inexpensive... Um, uh, digital signage is, is the wrong word, but it's one I'm going to use. <laughs> um, digital signage solution, because I do some other stuff too as well. But here's the interesting thing. They came out with, with, a, with a 4K uh, box. Now... <laughs> This was not the only 4K thing at NAB. There was a number of production solutions. There were a number of uh, cameras and, and projectors and things of that nature. Um, here's the one thing I didn't see, though, and, and I, I didn't personally go. I, I followed enough. Uh, like I said, there was plenty of press um, at, at NAB this year. I, did, I didn't, don't need to go, <laughs> unless you just like to go to Vegas, um, which is not a bad place. But you don't have... Currently, and I could be wrong on this, and please somebody, you know, email me or call me if I am. There's not a good solid uh, broadcast solution, which is is where I'm going with this. It is the National Association of Broadcasters Convention, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is not the National Association of Production Engineers or Producers uh, Convention. So the fact that there is still at this date a lack of 4K camera, cabling, switching, and broadcast, you know, the point in end-to-end -end solution when it comes to this, I still find fascinating. I still think, think that this is, this is the one thing that may trip up 4K in the long run. Now, BrightSign and their playback machine absolutely makes sense because the one thing that was in abundance at NAB was production equipment. You had all sorts of, of cameras. You had all sorts of, of devices um, that let you record in 4K and edit in 4K and put it up on YouTube in 4K or let people download it in 4K. But there was nothing yet that says, you know, we can shoot the Super Bowl, let's say, uh, in 4K and, and broadcast it. 
Uh, Michael, is this is this a limitation of the technology, or or our, or is it maybe our lack of infrastructure or our lack of ability to do this yet? I mean, you can do 4K with like four pieces of HDSDI, <laughs> four four cables of HDSDI. So that is, I, I you know, there's one cabling solution, but there's not you know one single cable or maybe two pieces. Uh, so are we just at a limitation right now when it comes to the infrastructure? Uh, or does people just not see the need to broadcast in 4K? Well, I, I think we're still a little early on. Um, and keep in mind that um, there are, even in, in the 4K resolution, there are a couple camps. So mm -hmm. there's kind of the digital cinema guys that have their uh, slightly different 4K uh, resolution, and then you, you have the uh, computer uh, uh, side. And there, uh, most of when you're working on a 4K product, for example, you're going to probably want to support both of those slightly different resolutions. Um, it gets a little trickier on some of these very wild aspect ratios that uh, some folks are also talking about as well. Um, but one thing that's interesting on the production side, um, when you're working on the development of products, uh, even though, as you said, there isn't, there aren't really talk about broadcasting uh, today anyways in, in 4K. Um, this to me reminds me of, of uh, HD when, when HD was starting. And um, at that same time, uh, you know, there were at, you could go to NAB uh, and when the Grand Alliance, the HD standard, uh, was was being implemented and put out. The exact same thing was true to what you're saying now, Tim. Meaning, um, there were, you could go there and you could see HD production units and and special cameras and all that, but the, there was no content. Um, when when you start looking at the digital signage or any any kind of playback uh, device, it's it's actually more important for that to be slightly ahead of the sources of the content. And the reason for that is when you look at a digital signage system that can't do HD is a good example. Uh, when they try to mix video in and it's a standard definition video, but yet they're able to do a higher resolution output, then the, uh, the standard definition windows, they don't look very good, you know, because it's a, it's of a, a and so um, I think this is a natural progression, but it is early. That makes sense, uh, Kelly. From from a standpoint of not only just a manufacturer, but also you know, uh, now you're the dark side with me. You're integrators. Um, <laughs> you know, when when we start having conversations with clients, um, and you start going out there and saying, you know, we are we can do uh, we can do 4K for you. Uh, the question is inevitably going to be how or why, um, and so how do you answer that question when it comes to you know, this is, yes, this is, it's the latest, greatest technology. Yes, it's the latest, greatest uh, resolution. But, you know, from a standpoint of, of trying to sell these these clients and these wonderful people, um, I, I guess, the, the, you know, how do we walk them along and say, yes, you want to go from HD to 4K? You know, whether, you know, just because to, to future-proof it or, or what have you, you know, how are we going to... How are we going to convince these folks to uh, to make the jump to 4K? Well, I think, you know, like Mike said, it's it's similar to the progression from SD to HD. You know, it's just the next biggest, baddest thing, you know, that's going to be out there. And, you know, even a couple years ago, it's like, why are you installing standard definition? You know, HD, you know, standard definition is becoming obsolete. HD is the next big thing. And I think it's the same with 4K. I think... I think, oddly enough, I think it's almost hitting, you know, the commercial market before it's actually hitting, you know, the consumer market, which I think is interesting. And I'll just, you know, throw out an example. Like, so my mom's TV croaked. We went to Costco, picked up a new flat screen or whatever, you know, and, and she's talking to her friend who thinks, he thinks he knows everything, right? So he's like, you need to return this TV and go get a 4K TV. And my mom is like 65. Her TV is like five feet from her you know, her five feet from her couch, and I'm like, Mom, you don't need a 4K TV, you know? I'm like, just, you know, the $500 TV you just bought is perfectly fine, and I think, you know, I think eventually it might, you know, well, eventually it will trickle down, you know, to the consumer side. Um, 
the commercial side, again, I think is really driving it. And I mean, it's 4K is awesome. You know, if, if you've seen it, you know it. And it's it's totally awesome when it's, you know, on a huge monitor in a big room. It makes a huge difference because you can see the detail and everything, which is awesome. And I think that's a big selling point. And I think, you know, and I think, I think Mike's right. I mean, it's nice to have all of the bits and pieces ready for when people actually start start buying it so you can actually install it. You know, it, it makes perfect sense. And more and more stuff is going to come out. I think Brightsign just kind of, you know, they, they're they definitely at the forefront of it. Well, and what's interesting, Kelly makes a good point because, and it's an, inter it's an interesting shift because a number of years ago, it, it's, it used to be, right? It used to be in, in, the, in the late 80s and the early 90s, it was commercial driving things. It was the commercial, it was the education, it was the boardrooms. Uh, here in St. Louis, one of the first um, uh, computer images to go through a projector was at Boeing. Uh, McDonald Douglas at the time, but now it's Boeing. And that's what drove it. And then something shifted, something somewhere in the late 90s, early 2000s, it shifted to where it was the it was the residential, right? It was the, the consumer electronics that was driving things. It was, you know, that one wonderful cable known as HDMI with the crappy connector um, that that drove it and that's what drove us in, into digital and now it's an interesting shift where now the commercial is back again right where the commercial is, is driving 4k um, one of the more interesting uh, applications that I've seen and I'm really excited to do it there's a couple of uh, hospitals in St. Louis here that, that we're working with and, and that's the uh, imaging uh, the, the ability to do medical imaging and, and doing away with um, with the old-fashioned um, x-rays and, and the ability to just to take an image and digitally take a picture of, of whatever, you know, whether it's an MRI or an old-fashioned, you know, broken bone x-ray and throw it up on a 4K display and get the resolution and, and look down deep into and to see really into, you know, whether it's, you know, it's a cross-section of, you know, your body or a broken bone. The, idea, the 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 application and the possibility there is really really kind of cool. So that I'm I'm I am excited as well as, as Kelly, you know, about 4K. So the possibilities are, are really really kind of cool. Um, you know, Tim, uh, yes. the one thing I'll I'll add or expand on what what you're saying, I I, I love it myself uh, as well. Um, the 4K um, because of the data rates. And the, the higher data rates, and and this is why in uh, uh, September uh, the HDMI uh, updated their spec to the 2.0 HDMI spec so that it can handle uh, the 4K resolution and primarily the data rates for the for that resolution. Um, one of the things that excites me though right now is um, the talk about color space, and um, we really don't we hadn't seen that very much. Um, uh, with any of the even the, the in, any of the previous standards, but on on this standard, um, and there's mo there are multiple resolutions. That's the other caution I'll throw out there: is people talk a lot about 4K, but you have to understand 4K is the 720p of Ultra HD. So um, be a little careful with that. So, anyways, uh, but color gamut and color space and having deep color and that what remind when you said when you were talking about medical imaging. That's such a difference when you can produce deep color, and so when you, when you talk about um, color space on displays, it's not just okay. Can this display do 4K? The real thing you should be asking is, can this display do 444 and a real you know deep color space? That's like the key to like for especially for medical imaging. If you're looking at a scan of the brain or something like that, and and if you can do the deep color, that makes all the difference in the world. Well, and, and not to not to also add, add on top of that, uh, can your switchers and your cabling <laughs> reproduce four four four? I mean, that's one of the more dangerous things, right? I mean, yes, your your display might be able to do it, and let's get crazy here and say that your cabling, whatever your cabling is, I don't, I'm not going to get into that, but but whether it's you know, uh, you know, um, some sort of um, you know fiber or you know actual HDMI or whatever. Um, but can your switchers, right? Can your, you know, are we getting to the point where, uh, and I'm talking about actual, you know, audio video switchers, not not, correct, um, uh, internet or uh, Ethernet switches, but can they handle that? I mean, some of the specs that I've read over the last couple six, yeah, three, you know, six seven months, some of them can't, uh, and they they, you know, if you drill down in, into the specs, they're you know they're not they're not exactly hitting all fours, so. 
uh, be very careful of that when you're when you're starting to talk about um, and you start designing and specking those switchers. Now, yeah. as long as you're passing along that information to the client, you know, not, you gotta knock yourself out. Use what you want to use, but understand, you know, make sure that you let them know and you understand what you're using before you start saying, "Oh yeah, I can reproduce anything, <laughs> you know, any color, all deep colors, and this, that, and the other." <laughs> Yeah. So. Well, you you've kind of touched on a really uh, potentially dangerous topic because, um, uh, as <laughs> you know, as uh, was said with uh, buying a, a television recently, you're going to have clients and customers who are coming to you and they see the demo of the 4K display mm -hmm. at the you know big box uh, retailer, right? And then they come to you, and you're you're doing your commercial audio video installation, and they're like, "Well, okay, we're spending this money, so we're going to spend on 4K monitors." And just like you said, they're going to think they're going to be able to produce 4K on or deep color on uh, that display just because they're buying the display, and they don't even realize all the infrastructure. Oh, what about sources? Well, what are you using for a source for 4K? And so you know. There's a big uh, edu There's a big opportunity, really, for us uh, in this industry to help educate them and not just play a game of specmanship. I'm going to specify that all displays in this uh, project all have to meet 4K. Well, what are the applications? Are you talking about a tiny little screen that uh, is five inch that needs to be 4K? So, what are the real applications? And I think that's where you were going with that earlier. But, anyways, I digress. So. No, you're fine. But real quickly, you said that that 4K is the 720 of of UHD. I thought UHD was the 720. Because you, isn't UHD TV the the lower resolution of actual true you know 4K, which is four times the so uh, okay within ultra high. Thank definition. you for asking that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and I had it in my head where the UHD TV was, <laughs> was actually the lower resolution of because my understanding is 4K is actually four times 1080. Okay, so um, this is my the, you've actually hit on exactly what I'm talking about in this industry. Okay. Okay. Um, this exact same conversation, I had this, that's why it's deja vu for me, because this exact same conversation happened before when the previous new high definition standard that was coming out that had 18 different resolutions in it, and everyone was talking about 720p, and they were building 720p switchers and building infrastructure for it and, and wiring buildings for it and doing all this. And we would talk to those um, integrators and, and designers and, and consultants. The consultants are the ones that usually are playing this specmanship game. And so uh, we'll say, well, you realize that 720p is the middle of that high definition standard, that one standard. Um, it's just like ultra high D. Uh, ultra HD, there are multiple resolutions, okay? Yep. The 4K is the middle, just, and that's why I say 4K is like uh, 720p on HD, okay. uh, meaning there there's standards that are, tw you know, you're saying that okay, 4K is uh, four times the 1080p, mm -hmm. is, is kind of what you're alluding to. Yes, okay, yeah. but but yes, but they're in the exact same standards that talk about 4K. There's also 8K. And so uh, and that's okay, my that's point is that everybody's talking about 4K the very same way they were talking about 720p. And my only, uh, you know, slight warning here is that you do have to be a little careful uh, with that. And, and I'm not making up numbers. I'm not saying, oh, uh, there's a 16K that's coming out. Uh, you know, uh, yes, as time goes on, the resolutions will get higher and higher. But what I am saying is in the exact same document that describes 4K, it also describes 8K, just like in the exact same document that describes 720p, also described 1080p. And so um, to me, that's the, the only mistake I see going on right now. And the one I see, I don't see as many. I, I, see, I see where you're going. In, in, the, in the commercial realm, absolutely. In, in the, the residential consumer electronics realm, I see the big the big issue uh, and and the big kind of smoke and mirrors thing going where they're calling something 4K when in actuality the actual resolution is that UHD that ultra high definition which is slightly less um, than than actual 4K. Can uh, they do so, that? Hmm. Can they do that? 
Sure, they can. They get, they're marketing. They, they do, do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and the other, the other thing is that a lot of this uh, content, of course, is being upscaled because people don't have 4K sources. Oh yeah, my my uh, really good friend of mine um, uh, teaches a class about digital uh, video and this, that, and the other. And his favorite thing from talking about 4K is the fact that you can go out right now and buy Ghostbusters in 4K. Swear to you, I swear to you, this is it. It's a, it's a, you know, it's, it says made for 4K and this, that, and the other. And you flip over the case, and on the back it says uh, mastered in 1080p or something like that. So basically, it's just nothing more than you know. It's marketing. I was gonna say, do they even have any like DVDs <laughs> or anything in 4K? No, not right. Because think about this, Kelly. I mean, you've got so a Blu-ray player, right? A Blu-ray disc is roughly 50 gigs, give or take, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's not, uh, there's not a, a medium right now. I mean, you're talking about a 100 gig disc, right? Uh, and that's compressed to get a, a 4K movie on. Now we could do what we used to do, right, with VHSs and have multiple multiple discs. Uh, if you remember, uh, well, Titanic was one of the movies that was on two, two VHS tapes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those big, long, epic, you know, epic battle movies, you know, those, those were always on, on multiple VHSs simply because they couldn't fit the movie uh, on, the actual, on the actual raw tape. So maybe that's what we'll go back to, where you have multiple discs. Well, the, the truth is that the way people are dis, uh, demoing 4K, they're using small servers. So you have a small little server that has a terabyte drive in it, and they can hold, uh, you know, you can put several 4K movies like on that. Sony sells a small uh, 4K uh, player uh, that you can do. And uh, I guess where I started off before I got on the 720p slant was, I was going to say that HDMI in September did uh, update their specification so that they could at least transmit on a single HDMI cable a uh, 4K. Um, the other problem is uh, almost everyone is chroma subsampling all the color, and it goes back to what I was saying again. Like I like the fact that we could actually now, with higher data rates, uh, and people are starting to talk about color, we can actually do true color and deep color uh, as opposed to chroma subsampled color, which is almost which is what's on every Blu-ray. So, yeah, <laughs> here's here's the, the oh I love HDMI and that consortium. Uh, that's a joke. Here's the thing about that spec. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know that anyone is quite manufacturing uh, with that chipset yet. Because <laughs> I don't think I think some, it, it was a, somebody yeah. said somebody. I think they physically have them in their shops, but they haven't started producing anything yet. The only thing I've ever seen was a little Sony server, a yeah. small Sony. It looks like almost like an Apple TV. Uh, that's the only thing I've ever seen with an actual HDMI 2.0 uh, connector. Legitimate HDMI. Le in theory. Well, what I, the reason I say legitimate is because you're going to see in the next couple, you know, well, between now and Infocom, I almost guarantee it, you'll see somebody out there that says, you know, we're 4K, this, that, and the other, and, and with HDMI and HDMI, we're HDMI 2.0 you know, certified, and this, that, and the other. Uh, they may be, they might be, but if they're shipping it right now, they're not because they, they don't have the chips. Um, unless they plan on either, you know, coming back to your, you know, coming back to your installations and swapping out, swapping out the chips, they're not. Uh, they're yeah, it's a hard, it's a hardware change. It's not yeah, a it's hardware change. It's, it's not firmware, dude. Right. You know, it's, it's, and even on the HDMI cables, um, they uh, in the past you've seen actually HDMI uh, revisions where they change the cables, they change the pin. This time, um, there's only six of the 19 pins that they they uh, adjusted the frequency on, and so um, the cables, uh, they're gonna you're gonna see all kinds of marketing for advanced cables, but really the cables are pretty compatible. Well, what's funny is uh, I had a buddy of mine uh, we were talking about this whole switchover, and he said right now. Um, uh, old res resolution HDMI cables are like they're trying to get rid of them. <laughs> so yeah, if you're trying to catch up on on HDMI cables, you know, stock up on them right now because you 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 can get them for a good deal. So yeah. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's well let's move on. Let's talk about our, our friends over at uh, Middle Atlantic. Uh, Middle Atlantic is uh, tell you what this this is a neat story because um, yeah, over the last oh good lord three years now. Um, We've done this kind of a, this whole AV Nation thing, and AV Week has been kind of a labor of love. And and 
we're going to see where we can take this. And so one of those one of those steps is taking on uh, sponsors and sponsors and, and people that we believe in. And one of those people, honest to goodness, is is Mid Atlantic Products. Uh, Mid Atlantic is somebody that I've personally used. Um, I've used their credenza for a bunch of years. I've used their racks. This is a neat product, though. Uh, it's called the Tech Ped, and mainly because, well, it's it's a pedestal table with technology in it. So you get a Tech Ped, Tech Ped. Um, it's a conference table, and you, it's not just a conference table. You also have a, there's, they also have models that have huddle room, huddle room tables as well, uh, which are obviously single pedestals. Uh, tons and tons of finishes to choose from. So if you're working with um, a consultant, <clears throat> as as not nice as they are to deal with, uh, and they have a specific um, uh, color or what have you, take it to, to Mid Atlantic, and if they don't have something, I'm sure they can. You know, get something very. Really, you know, they don't have the exact one. They can get something real close. Uh, they've got different options. They got power in there. They got wild mode, wired mold, cable retractors, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so get go by the website. Um, if you don't, if you're riding in your car and you can't write this down, go to our website, avnation.tv. There's a couple different ads there. Click on that and it'll take you there. But if you are uh, sitting down at your desk and you want to go there now, go to. Uh, middleatlantic.com forward slash avionation hyphen tech ped middleatlantic.com forward slash avionation hyphen tech ped uh, and if you want to see this in person uh, I am most certain that they will be showing this uh, at Infocom in about two months um, and next week actually we'll be talking about uh, their uh, their booth and this that, and the other what they plan on doing so go by the website middleatlantic.com forward slash avionation hyphen tech ped Middle Atlantic products, what great systems are built on. All righty. Uh, from our friends over at EC Magazine, uh, which is electronic electrical contractor. Uh, I find stories everywhere. Warning, more competition ahead. And Kelly, since you joined the dark side with me, we're going to kick this one off with you. Uh, basically, according to EC and the, uh, EC Magazine, they're talking about Security companies, and, and specifically home security and energy management companies, getting into the automation market um, with a bunch of, of solutions that are tied around mobile, right? Where you've got AT&T, you've Verizon, you've got um, Rogers Communication, I believe, is, is the one up in Canada. These are companies that sell not only cable, but, you know, wireless and this, that, and the other, and they also have the security Solutions. Well, these security solutions are already are also turning into um, green solutions, as it were. You know, where you you're given the ability to turn off your lights after a certain time, or you know, lock your doors, or you know, and, and if you can turn off your lights, well, hey, you know, we can, if you plug your TV into this outlet, and I give you control over that, well, then guess what? You can you've got now you've got an, an AV ish um, automation solution. Um, so, first question, Kelly, is: Is do you think people like you and me, um, or you know, our compatriots in in the industry, first of all, should we be worried about it? And if, if we are um, worried about it, or we start running into these folks, is there you know what can we do to differentiate ourselves uh, from these folks that are already in there with with their security and their their uh, their other automation systems? Um, I think it's kind of the you know old adage of do you really want your cable or phone guy, you know, putting together your security system? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I paid 50 bucks when I moved into my place to have some guy set up my internet, my wireless, everything. And not only did he take the packaging of the modem I bought so I couldn't get a warrant or my rebate on it, <laughs> he set it up wrong. So I had to have my IT guy from Vadio come to my house and reset it up. And it's like... Do you want that guy? Do you want your life, your security, everything in the hands of that guy? I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> you know, so it's, I mean, it's, on one hand, yeah, it's easier to, you know, stick with one company, your phone company or your cable company or whatever for everything, but, it, you know, they're two completely different things. You know, you, and as an integrator or a security company, you really, you need to sell your services, you need to sell your professionalism, your experience, and give them the reasons, yeah, why you don't want, Joe Schmo, who, you know, has no schooling, no, no anything, putting together your security system. But that's my take on it. Well, and then, let me ask you this, because as, as eloquently as you put that, 
Um, Sorry. <laughs> how do I? No, no. It was it was neat. Um, but when you're dealing with a client, how do I say you don't want that guy? <laughs> because you can't say that, can you? You don't want that guy doing that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the way the way you sell yourself any other time, you know. I don't myself well. <laughs> you know, you're certified. You have the experience. You know, your company's backed. You have, you know. You know, sell them on sell them on everything you know because you know your cable company isn't doing that, and that's I mean that's the way you're gonna win. I'll tell them I won't throw away their warranty card. How about that? Yeah, that was so annoying. <laughs> no kidding. Good night. And then yeah. I called them and they're like, they're like, no, um, we don't sell modems. I'm like, I bought it from you. No, we don't do that. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> no, we don't. Whatever. Uh, we don't sell that. Sorry, you didn't get it from us. Yeah. Then don't cash my check, dude. Uh, <laughs> Michael, uh, when it comes to... It, I've, I've heard this this argument more than once, so as a manufacturer, I will bring it to you because it was a manufacturer that I first heard it from. One person to blame, one person to call, one person to rely on, one number when anything goes wrong. So when Kelly's entire house goes to black... <laughs> And the little lights on her modem stop working. She has one person to call, the guy that threw away her, her warranty information. So yeah. is that is that valid? Is that is that a valid sales strategy from, from a security stand from a security company standpoint? Uh, and if so, how do we how does how do integrators, you know, kind of work work against that or work around that? Well, uh, I I think it's perfectly valid for them to say that uh, until someone experiences their their support, um, because then the customer you won't have to uh, convince the customer about that. They'll say, "Oh, that's the ones where uh, I'll be there from nine to five somewhere in that time frame, and uh, I'll call you back and and you know and I'll throw away your manual and and uh, all of that as well." But um, the one thing that I will say is I. I look at it a little differently. Um, our industry is basically built on lots of small companies. Uh, and the companies that you're talking about from this story are large corporations. I, and I'm talking about uh, even the uh, manufacturers um, like a Clear One or Crestron from our industry compared to the companies you're referring to are still tiny. Yeah. So uh, when you look at the Verizon, a Comcast, AT&T, Time Warner type company, um, they have so much scale, so much uh, marketing muscle that I look at this as a great opportunity for our industry because they are educating the masses as to what you could do in a house. Like, in, in other words, they're bringing up this application. Oh, yeah, I, I would kind of like to do this or I'd like to do that. And there's no way if everybody in our entire industry advertised uh, or did everything, we couldn't make a scratch in what they can do. And so I see this as um, all the tide is raising and all of our small boats are rising with it because now people will be more educated and aware of the different technologies and, and abilities. And then I'm the other thing is they keep their uh, offerings pretty uh, short. Like they have l very limited security options, very limited um, automation options. It's just you know you take their bundle A, B, or C. Um, whereas uh, most of our uh, you know most of the companies in the Infocom uh, spaces or CDA spaces, um, when you look at that, we're already adapt to make customize exactly what they want. And so we will look like rock stars uh, compared to somebody throwing away their your their box. Yeah. Uh, that's a really that good kind of, point. Yeah, it is. And is that kind of why I mean that's why I'm excited about Microsoft coming because I see the same thing where, you know, they're bringing light to something we've been doing, right? Uh, and and nobody still knows what they're doing in Infocom unless you do, Michael. Do you do you, Michael? Uh, not that I can say. I, just <laughs> I won't but, tell but still, anybody. How about that? <laughs> but still, the those are good signs because they will. Uh, when you look at other, um, 
you know, we don't really compete with each other, to be honest. We think we do, but we really don't. We compete more with the guy who's selling granite uh, for countertops or the guy who's selling uh, swimming pools or, you know, these other big capital investment um, entertainment aspects. And the more people are aware of this from the Microsoft's at and whoever says, oh, you mean from my phone I could close my garage door or check my lights or, or open the door for somebody or things like that. That is huge because they, again, only do it's just a limited aspect of what somebody can really do and that opens the door for us to come in and really show, okay, now that you've got your, you know, now that you've got your tra training wheels, we will really show you what you can, how you can ride. And so I, I see it as a good thing. That's a really good point. I didn't think about that. Uh, okay, this is an interesting story that came. I, God love uh, Twitter and, and the social media. Um, I, I connected with these folks. Um, it's called the Juice on Wall Doc, and if you're watching uh, the the video, check it out because it's it's kind of a it's a neat little device. Uh, these two guys. It's, it's the website's Nox One N O X O N E dot com, and they're trying to get some Kickstarter going. They, they, you can't buy this yet. Uh, so don't, don't try. Uh, I actually asked for a review unit. <laughs> they don't have those yet either. So, uh, <laughs> nice try. Yeah, I, I tried, you know. Um, but here's the thing. It's, it's an on-wall dock for your iPad, right? And uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of neat. And the, the little thing here, there's one picture here with a clock, and I thought it was really sweet. Um, but it's a, it's a charger, and it's a, it's a wall dock as well. And in talking about, you know, uh, like like Kelly and Michael just talked about with with all the other integration, we've got mobile devices, so you could use this as your dock for your AMX, or your uh, your Crestron um, interface, and it charges at the same time. Here's where I'm going with this story because I've got this one here, and then our our buddy Chris Netto has recently uh, started something, honestly, just <clears throat> very grassroots. Excuse me, he's making custom mic covers, and they're called uh, his is called Chop Shop Mics dot uh, com. And if you're into, let's just say rock and roll or, or hard rock, these are some of the coolest freaking uh, mic covers. They're they're leather and there's you know studs and you know, all kinds of you know stuff. That's pretty badass. Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, he actually told me he told me yesterday um, that he's got a a band out of D.C. that he just made some for, and they're 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 going to start using them on the road, and. Mm -hmm. They're just, you know, they're, they're the coolest thing. Yeah, that's, a, that's the wrong picture. Um, that these these people just out of, you know, not the, not the Chris is a talented. He's a nice guy, but but it, it was an idea that came to him, right? He was just messing around one day, and he's like, eh, you know, what what would happen if I took this leather and just kind of wrapped it around? Oh, that's kind of neat. Well, what would happen if I did this and this and this? And you know, a couple days later, he starts posting uh, pictures on on Instagram of these leather wrapped microphones. Um, now, Michael, I'll ask the question to you all first because you're a manufacturer, right? Um, you guys have got creative and, and, and engineering people that are really smart, but you've also got that creative side. How do how does somebody like Chris or like the guys from from uh, the, uh, the 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 Juice Waldock? How do they get above the fray? How do they get above the, the clear one? How do they get above the Crestron to get folks noticing them? Um, is it buying you know a, a ten by ten booth at Infocom or is it doing you know? Uh, just kind of more of the grassroots Kickstarter type stuff. Well, I I think they uh, if they're doing the crowdfunding like the Kickstarter, I think it's uh, insufficient by itself. So what they need to do is they need to tie in the Kickstarter campaign with things like Infocom and uh, for example, uh, you know, get in with the uh, education side, the renewal credit side, and you know, as uh, you know, in the Kickstarter where they say, oh, uh, if you pledge $25, you get this. Well, if there are very creative ways where they can bring in a whole industry and the industry will embrace it. Um, just by mentioning some of the things like that, um, they should have a booth at uh, Infocom. Absolutely, they should have people walking around with those microphones so that people can, you know, put their um, like feel the leather and feel the microphone. They should also get with uh, microphone manufacturers. So you know, when you when you there are several manufacturers who build. Uh, I mean, there are 
very popular uh, manufacturers that they could uh, be predominant in their booth. And then they promote that in the crowdfunding side as well. Um, so, I mean, there's all kinds of things. Like, I'll give you one other example. Um, people, uh, the, the Infocom Expo is for the industry professionals only, correct? Um, I mean, there are some. Sometimes there are some student initiatives. And hey, hang on a second. Last year, there was a large contingent of technology managers. Now we can argue whether or not technology managers are end users or not. Or not. We, we've had that discussion before. Uh, but but there was a large contingent of those guys, who, granted, they're not going to buy leather wrapped microphones, but they <laughs> might buy the other stuff. You know. Certainly, but I, I, um, what I mean is that um, you can get an organization like Infocom behind a Kickstarter or a, any kind of crowdfunding type event by tying in a few things. And one of those is that consumers are not usually allowed uh, into an industry okay. trade show, and so as part of the you know level, if you fund the if you're funding them, hey, we're going to get you passes into the last day of Infocom or what have you, just like some of the student uh, ones and so forth. But those are huge things, and it wouldn't really cost them anything. Infocom would do it for free, and then Infocom would promote it to the you know thousands and thousands of members there. And if you got us, our industry behind you. It it would fuel those uh, very well. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Miss Perkins, one of my favorite marketing people, put your put your marketing and, and genius hat on, and help these folks get get above the fray, right? Help them, you know, you know, like Michael said, you you might be a combination, where you do get a booth at Infocom and you you also do the Kickstarter and this that and the other. Um, is it like like Chris is doing with with social media and, and actually like the the guys from from the Juice as well? I mean, they're they're big on, on, on Twitter and, and Facebook. Twitter is where I found them. Uh, Chris has got the Instagram thing going as well. Is that all there is to it, or is there is there maybe a step or two more that they need to do? Um, I mean, I think social media is huge. I mean, you found it that way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, what Mike said, partnering, you know, with maybe some manufacturers, if you, I mean, I don't, it might be, you know, harder to do than, than you might think if you're not in the industry, you know. Um, you know, looking at associations, I mean, honestly, find some consumers to use it, you know. Yeah. Once people actually start using some of this stuff, you know, word travels pretty quickly. I mean, you can start locally, you can, you know, start wherever, you know, wherever you can get a bite, you know, and sometimes on social media, it's, it's not locally. Um, you know, like with Chris's stuff, you know, he's, that he found a band in Washington D.C. Start sending them out. You know, I mean, you know, you don't want to go broke, but at the same time, send you know a couple out to some different bands that you know about, or you know, maybe talk to people that you know. You know, I think a lot of it's, I think a lot of it's word of mouth, um, and just trying to do everything you can to get your name out there. I mean, it's. It's, I think it's pretty tough to get above the fray. Um, you know, there's so many cool new little electronics and little doodads and little inventions that never really go anywhere that we never hear about, you know, because there are so many big companies that kind of overtake it. But, you know, if you can get that one manufacturer, that one right person, you know, to back you and be excited about it, that's all it really takes. Yeah, that's true. I think I'm gonna have him. I'll, I'll have him make me one for Infocom, and that's what I'll, I'll walk around the show floor when I interview people. There you go. I, I think it's so cool. I love those. I love Chris's microphone. I do too. So. Reps. I'm literally even called. <laughs> They're called chop shops. Chop shop mics. There you go. Um, but yeah, maybe if he can, if I can, I don't know, get one in the colors of Aviation Nation, or maybe he doesn't have anything, any words on them, so maybe I don't know. Get it. Anyhow. All right, guys, that's going to do it for, uh, for us this week. Uh, Michael Braithwaite is uh, from Clear One, but also uh, a part of the Avenue Alliance. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you for having me, and definitely uh, check us out at the um, Avenue Alliance, you know, the uh, .org, avenue.org, and uh, also uh, clearone.com if you're, if you're interested in uh, finding out about cool uh, audio video over internet protocol products. 
uh, and not to put you on the spot, I should have asked you this before. Uh, do you know yet, or can you say what uh, what sort of things you guys, uh, the Avenue, is going to have at uh, at Infocom this year? Um, I'm not I'm not able to say. We are we there are lots of new devices that uh, and some new members that uh, will be in the booth, and there will be a system that is there that you will be able to see where different manufacturers kind of a. Uh, uh, co-mingling or plug and fest type uh, uh, setup as well. Kind of like what you guys did last year. That was really cool. That yes, was, that was. And, and honestly, uh, Michael, not to not to no, not to you know blow and smoke up your skirt, but it, that was right, that last year was was kind of when I started to uh, to kind of see the real the real neatness of AVB uh, because it was inter, inter it was an inter, the inter system communication between um, Sennheiser, Sure, uh, Yamaha. And uh, an avid going into a um, eventually into a Pro Tool system. Yes. <laughs> that right, I was like, okay, I'll start you know learning more about this. So yeah, that was that was really neat. So. Uh, all right, Miss Kelly Perkins. It's going to be hard not to say from Vadio from ABI Systems Marketing Goddess Extraordinaire. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. It's been fun. It's been a while. <laughs> it has been a while. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at. AVI underscore Kelly is my Twitter handle. We also started an AVI Systems Twitter as well that we kind of soft launched last week or avisystems.com. So. Uh, all right. Uh, don't follow me on Twitter, although AVI Systems was nice enough to do so and I followed them back. Um, but go by the website if you would, uh, avnation.tv, avnation.tv. You'll find this program and a host of others. Miss Kelly also... Uh, Co-host with uh, with AV Dawn, our our social media and marketing show called AV Social. Uh, a new DIY is uh, is coming down the pike. The weekly AV app show, the uh, the best hair on podcasting, which is with Matt Scott and uh, High Five Phil Cordell. Uh, every uh, Wednesday or Thursday, typically, they'll post a new show where they review AV apps. Crazy enough, it takes about five ten minutes, but it's actually very very cool, very entertaining. Um, and it's always uh, it's always a lo load of fun. So all sorts of other programs coming down the pike. Avianation.tv, Avianation.tv. Don't forget, Avianation is brought to you by Middle Atlantic Products and their tech head technology pedestals. Middle Atlantic Products, what great systems are built on. Thank you so much for listening. This has been AV Week. <laughs>